Okay, hello everybody. Uh, you have finally heard our new title of this show. We're not just calling it whatever random title pops up into my head right now. We previously had Mason Deaver on the show talking about their book, I Wish You All the Best. Now we welcome a new writer with a book out next year on 2nd of June 2020 called The Henna Wars. Please welcome to the show, I really hope I do not uh, butcher, the, butcher your last name, Adiba Jaigarder? Agardar. Agardar. You're close. Okay. <laughs> See, I, I'm so afraid of doing that because, like, uh, I, I could not pronounce uh, Farida's name when I had her on. <laughs> it's okay. It's just about like trying. Yeah, fair enough. So, uh, w- welcome to the show. I've been wanting to have uh, you on for a while now because you and Farida, I kind of refer to you as like the dynamic duo of uh, some sections of book Twitter because you're always like back and forth on certain stuff. Okay, that's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, whenever I scroll through Twitter, it's like every day I see uh, either Farida or you just chat in or you've retweeted something and then it's usually about the bigger issues. But uh, we'll get right into your book because w- when I heard it uh, described in uh, one of your pitch, uh, it sounded like the most adorable thing I'd ever heard. So uh, do you want Thank to- you. <laughs> so do you want to tell us a little bit about the uh, what we can expect from the Henna Wars, uh, your journey as a writer? uh Um, So The Henna Wars is basically um, about two teen girls. Um, One of them, the main character, is uh, Bengali, and she's a lesbian. And she basically comes out to her parents. Um, It doesn't go particularly well for her. Um, And she decides to kind of deal with it by turning herself into doing henna. Um, But then um, her childhood crush kind of comes back to school and they both start rival henna businesses um and so it's like a big deal because they're competing but they're also like into each other um and she's also dealing with all the stuff with her parents and her family um so that's um like just a general summary of the henna wars see because when i saw the description i thought it was like a sort of enemies to lovers trope thing but it doesn't really sound like that it kind of is like i i think of it as, as like um childhood friends to rivals to lovers a lot of uh, twos in that yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's how you do character development folks thank you but no it, no it does sound um really cute and fun as opposed to i'm assuming because i, I spoke to with mason about this uh last time and uh, with Frida as well I assume you're you're probably on board with this idea but I'm really sick of seeing like the uh, cis white people even if the, the cis queer white people declaring certain genres dead when different types of writers haven't had a chance to write their version of it and especially that annoys me because growing up in Dubai and like being around a lot of like Muslim families I I sort of know that their perspective on this kind of story like a cutesy sort of love story and even coming out, it's going to be entirely different than what a uh, cis white queer person goes through. So uh, was that something that kind of drew you to writing this story? Kind of. I mean, the the gist, like, the first inkling of the idea for writing the story was just the idea of the henna competition. That's where, and I actually wrote a first draft that didn't really have, like, the coming out and everything. Um, And I felt like something was missing. And that was the whole coming out story. So in my second draft, I went back and I added it. And then I felt like, yeah, like, this is the story that I want to tell. Um, But then when I was kind of, when I wanted to query the story, I did find a lot of agents were kind of saying they didn't want coming out stories. So at that point, I felt that like kind of frustration that you were talking to Mason and Farida about, because like, they, like they were kind of saying, I've already seen this, there's so much of it. And like, I was thinking, first of all, maybe there's a couple of stories about this, but actually there aren't very many, um, especially, like, in mainstream media. There's, like, Simon, and, like, that's a movie now, so everybody knows it. But other than that, like, you don't really know a lot of coming out stories, even for white, cis, queer people. Um, and second of all, because, yeah, the experience is, like, so, so different from someone who is Muslim and Bengali, um, and that has definitely like not really been explored before um especially in a way where it's not about the pain it's really just about falling in love but yeah i I love that kind of stuff that you're saying because it's uh i mean i hate to use this example because i because just from how i've grown up i kind of associate it with all teen stories it kind of sounds like a sort of a john Husey kind of thing but with that different perspective going on 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think I've actually watched a lot of John Hughes movies, but from, like, just cultural assimilation, I guess. Yeah, I, I think probably, yeah. Yeah, and it, and uh, did you have a lot of um, influences, like, in the YA community or uh, read any stories that made you think, oh, yeah, I could do this as well? Because your journey sounds kind of similar to mine in that it was something first, and then I also felt mine was missing something. I think, for me, Deviant Pit was a big influence, just because it's, like, when you're marginalized, like, in multiple ways... Um, you kind of feel like nobody really wants your story out there and nobody's really rooting for you. So when I went on Twitter and I saw DB Pit happening for the first time and I saw um, how much attention there was and how many people were looking for these stories, I felt like, well, if I write these stories, then maybe there's actually people who are going to root for me and who are going to support me and who are going to want to read the stories. So that was like a big thing. But also, like, there are books like Sonia Menon's books, um, When Dimple McRishi, um, From Tunkle with Love, um, and S.K. Ali's books, um, Love from A to Z, Saints and Misfits. And I think they're all, they're all really, really great books, first of all. But also, they centralize POC narratives. You know, they're very much for POC. And I'd never really seen that before. So, like, just reading that, I felt like, yeah, there are definitely people who are. I want to read my stories as well. I I want to read this as well because it's kind of giving me that nostalgia of growing up in Dubai and seeing henna stands like everywhere. Like, you know, I I came back to Scotland. I mentioned uh, the someone mentioned to me, oh yeah, they do like a sort of body paint thing. I was like, oh yeah, well, yeah, we had henna. And then, you know, being uh, like, you know, typical white Scottish bros are like, what the fuck's henna? <laughs> <laughs> but like in a really uh, weird Scottish accent. Scot- Scotland's a weird place sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds exactly like the kind of thing I would read. And I'm always looking for, I mean, I don't know if other readers do this, but I, besides reading about stuff that's I know is my own experience. I love reading stuff that's from other people's experiences too, because I feel that can give a writer and even readers more knowledge on how different these things are, how nuanced they are. I like a, a Muslim coming out story is not going to be the same as a cis white queer story. It's, it's just not. And having those differences come out in these kind of stories, like um, when Dimple met R- R- Rishi, I I've not read it, but I see that used as a comp title very often. So I take mm-hmm. it I should probably get my ass to the bookstore and see if I can find it. It's a really good book. You should definitely, you should definitely read it. Is is it kind of like a play on When Harry Met Sally? You know what? So I'm I'm very like not knowledgeable about like pop culture, especially when it comes to movies. Um, so I haven't watched When Harry Met Sally, but the title comes from that, and I know that Sandhya is a pretty big fan of all of those movies. So it's possible, yes. Yeah, because from what I remember, that movie was about like uh, the idea that a man can't be with a woman because there's all there always going to be an, a romantic element to it. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Is when Dimple met Rishi? Is that a queer story? Or... No, it's um, it's an FM story. All oh, right, okay. Yeah, so... oh, not not a queer story. Sorry, FM stories can be queer as well, but it's not a yeah. queer story. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of terms when it comes to the uh, queer terminologies, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, I, I'll, I'll be straight up honest. I still haven't gotten my grasp on all of them, and I'm a queer person. So, yeah, I think like the most important thing is just to be aware that, or just to be open to learning. That's the most important thing. Yeah, definitely, because uh, learning's a great thing. I mean, that's that's kind of why I read. Not only do I love seeing great, entertaining stories, but I like seeing the lessons that you can learn from them. And this definitely sounds like something that I would be interested in learning from, and probably enjoy reading. It, your your release date is a it's a UK release date, right? I'm assuming, right? No, it's actually a US release date. Oh, does does it have a UK one? Um, not yet, and I don't know if it will, but I'll definitely let you know if it does. Uh, this, well, I is this this is going to be one of those moments where I had to like hunt for it because I did that with Mason's book as well. Like, find it on some website or some store from eBay, play the extra shipping costs, but fuck it, it is worth it. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can get it, like, on the book depository, so it won't be too difficult to get. I I keep forgetting that website exists. It would probably be quite useful. 
Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> yeah, and um, I want to go more a bit into your influences and the stuff that you like as well, because, I mean, we've been following each other for a while, and there's one character in particular I feel we both love who's recently been announced to be getting a television show. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. Do I? Is it? I have a really bad memory. Oh, uh, well, um, uh, Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel. Oh my god, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, I am very, very excited about that. Yeah, because uh, that for me was like, I've read Marvel comics all my life, and I've always loved the sort of younger superheroes like, you know, Spider-Man, Human Torch, some members of the X-Men and stuff like that. When Miss Marvel came around, of course you're getting the guys who are like, oh, why are we having this? This is just like, you know, the forced diversity bullshit. But reading that, her experience as becoming a superhero was so different to like a Peter Parker or someone like that. And it was so fun and engaging to read. So I've got a lot of high hopes for that show. And I am at, and it just goes to prove my further point is that th these different experiences, even if they're familiar stories, it's the perspective that's going to make them special. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons why like so many people love like Kamala Khan just because like she's so relatable. Like she has a universal experience, but at the same time, it's very specific to her like culture and to her religion. Um, so everybody can relate to it, but at the same time, she has the specificity to it that makes her very human. Well, let, let's get into your sort of beginnings as a writer. What could you name any like major influences you had growing up uh, that made you want to pursue storytelling? Honestly, like I've always kind of been a storyteller. Even before I could write, I would like come up with stories in my head and everything. And I was really lucky because um, my parents and my family in general really like encouraged that. Um, like they used to, or like when because I, I used to live in Bangladesh and then I lived in Saudi Arabia for a bit and you didn't really have access to a lot of English books at that time. Um, but my family would always make sure that they would buy me a lot of English books. Um, so I was always reading. I was always writing. I think probably my big influence for romance is Meg Cabot because I used to read her like religiously when I was a teenager. Um, she is just like such a great, romance writer um i loved the princess diaries i loved the mediator series that was probably like my introduction to romance and i just i loved her books um i haven't reread her stuff uh, recently and i haven't read her recent stuff so i don't know how she holds up um but i just remember loving her when i was a teen I also, I love Mallory Blackman. She's definitely been a big influence for me mm -hmm. um, just because she was actually the first time I saw like a POC writing and I saw like white people actually reading her. Um, so that was like kind of like a life changing moment for me just to see her like existing and writing the stories that she does. Um, and also another big influence is uh, Melinda Lowe. Um, who I love, um, and especially because she is Asian and she's queer and she's writing um, like a lot of like POC queer stories. So that was also like a life changing moment to see that for me. Uh, uh, Mallory Blackman gets mentioned as an influence an awful lot on this show. <laughs> That's because she's amazing. She is. Uh, <laughs> I I I love the. Uh, are, are you a Doctor Who fan? <laughs> I'm not, no. Uh, she, she, I believe she wrote the Rosa Parks episode that was just in the Jodie Whittaker series. That was phenomenal. Yeah, and I think she's written for Doctor Who before. I'm sure possibly. she has, Although, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, the only thing I remember of Mally Bracken from my childhood was her, her book Pig Heart Boy. I believe it got like a CBBC adaptation, and that was kind of like my introduction to her, but I haven't been able to find much of her stuff since. Um... The, the series by her that I, I love, and I think that's the most popular of hers, is Knots and Crosses. That's going to be yeah. um, a BBC show soon. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I Like, I read all the books. I used to follow that series, like, with all my friends. We were all obsessed with it. It's amazing. I definitely recommend it. What's Knots, Knots and Crosses about? I remember reading it was like a, it was like a mystery kind of thing. Um, no. It's basically a dystopian um where like everything or race relations are flipped 
the other way. So like black people are the ones with the power and white people are the ones who are kind of subjugated. Um, and then, yeah, it's basically about the one knot and one cross, like kind of falling in, or being friends and falling in love in that world. That's, that's a really interesting concept. I've never thought of that. Yeah. And like, she does such a good job of it because I feel like she just understands the history of race relations and all of that. So she does a great job of flipping it and making you actually see the world that we live in um, by showing us the world that exists in her book. Well, I'm definitely going to be on the lookout for that because like, I'm not really a big dystopia person, but that that idea for a dystopia sounds really interesting. It's really, really good. Well, onto the book depository, I will go after this. <laughs> Once I get some money in my card. <laughs> uh, uh, just just being out of university and trying to find a job is a fucking nightmare. <sighs> yeah, it, as, I imagine it's especially difficult considering like everything in the UK right now. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> It's it's almost like, do we have to pay you if you work for us? I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> no. But anyway, I can rant about the UK's job services on another show. Not this one. Maybe, I don't know. If someone's doing a podcast about job industries, yeah, just invite me on that. <laughs> but um, be, beyond this, um, I'm curious if you'd ever want to explore like other genres. Because I know Farida's doing um, middle grade thing now and well, I was speaking with Mason and they said they were doing uh, a ghost story that wasn't a ghost story so I, I'm always curious to see what kind of like dream projects authors have beyond their debuts Um, yeah I definitely want to explore more genres I actually love challenging myself to writing different genres a big thing that I want to tackle is like a kind of like an alternate history fantasy um, which is talking about like colonialism, and um, that would be like my big kind of dream project. But I'm not great at writing fantasy, so I'm also very afraid of it. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, it's <laughs> I kind of stay away from doing big fantasy because there's so much world building involved, and that just freaks me out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I that definitely freaks me out too. I prefer my fantasies to be like Coraline or something, where it's just a little bit added in. Yeah, like contemporary fantasy or light fantasy. Yeah, I like that too. Um, that's what I like. I've written some short stories that are more in the line of that, and I know I can do that. Um, but building a world that's completely fantasy, completely different from ours—that's something I want to try. It's ambitious, but you know, if you pull that off, man, that's going to be a fucking great achievement. <laughs> and speaking of short stories, I believe you had one of those published recently? Yeah, it was in um, an anthology called Keep Faith. Yes, and I'm going to I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say it was the one involving a plane ride, yeah? Oh, no, no, that, no. Was, that was before. That was in 2017, I think. Right, um, that's that the was, one I read. Yeah, so that was in an anthology called Momentum. Yeah, I I do remember that. It was like someone going on a plane ride and for university or something like that. Yeah. Because uh, ironically, I got that downloaded for, I, th I think it was free one day or something. I got that downloaded for free and read it on my flight to Cyprus, ironically. <laughs> and, I mean, if that's the kind of style that you're doing for your short stories, that makes me even more excited for your debut. Because the way you, like, describe the feeling of anxiety and differences amongst like different cultures and that and how someone else feels about going to university in another country you tackled a lot of subjects there and somehow made them all relevant and all work and i was i was really impressed with it thank you i'm really glad you enjoyed it because i feel like i wrote that such a long time ago um i barely even remember it to be honest like i have a really really bad memory just just so that's clear, like I will literally write something, and then the next week I'll have forgotten reading that, uh, writing that. So that's how bad my memory is. By any chance, do you remember the name of your book that's coming out next year? I think it has something to do with henna <laughs> and, and some wars. 
and the. Oh god, I'm just saying the words of the title. <laughs> oh god, I, I I need a caffeine boost right now. My brain is not working. <laughs> That's fair enough. Apparently, this is the best time of day to have a cup of coffee because it's like late enough in the day to give you a boost, but not too late for you to not sleep at night. I mean, that's tea, but uh, I drink coffee whenever I want now. Uh, okay. That's just something I read. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's probably very right. It's, it's, it's such a pain because it's the only hot drink I have in the house and it's fucking freezing. <laughs> it's actually quite warm here still. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, well, I suppose you are on the mountains. It might be warmer there. Yeah, where whereabouts in Scotland are you? I'm in Renfrew, which is just outside Glasgow, uh, next to the River Clyde. So every every morning, I see the creature from the Black Lagoon popping out of it. Okay, that sounds like fun. Yeah, uh, uh, there's so much pollution in that river. Like, I think you could dive into it and get fucking superpowers. <laughs> it's like that in our um, in our Liffey River as well. Uh, that's the main river that runs through Dublin. Um, it's it's absolutely filthy. Oh god, you come out of it looking like fucking swamp thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I make too many nerdy references on this. It's really bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the uh, thing that's uh, the most interesting to me about these kind of stories coming out, and I want more of them to happen. You know how people are always saying there's no original stories anymore. Everything has been done. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like putting different perspectives on it is always going to make it fresh. And I'll use an e- example from uh, one of the most successful movies of the last few years. Uh, when I saw the trailers for Get Out, like I wasn't sure what it was going to be. And the way that it put a different perspective on this horror thriller aspect that we've seen a lot of times, it completely elevated the genre to a new level and... After that, there was a lot more of those stories getting greenlit. So I've seen the effect of it in the movie industry. I hope that it happens for the book industry as well. So that's why I'm sort of seeking out these kind of books that are not by people who look like me all the time. Because if they're successful, it means we're going to get fresher takes and more nuanced perspectives on these stories. And more kids will be able to see themselves in them. Yeah, for sure. And I think I think what a lot of people don't realize is that um just by the fact of having someone different as the protagonist completely changes the story like you can have like a story that you have like read a billion times or um adapted a billion times like say cinderella um and you you make cinderella for example muslim that story is going to be completely different just because of that reason because yeah. Her being Muslim is going to have so many effects on the story. Um, And people don't really realize this um, a lot of the times. Like, it it does, like, adding that kind of identity or having a protagonist who is different completely changes a story, makes it fresh, makes it new. Definitely, man. There was a movie that came out this year, actually, uh, I think it was kind of around that line. Did you see uh, Blinded by the Light? I didn't, no. Uh, That was, like... um, it's kind of like a bit like Sing Street, but it's from the perspective of a Pakistani uh, Muslim teenager who finds the words of Bruce Springsteen and kind of gets inspired and kind of begins to find himself. Okay. It's really hmm. good. Like, definitely one of my favorites this year. And I think it's from it the, sounds really interesting. I think it's from the same director who did Bend It Like Beckham. Oh, I love Bend It Like Beckham. And uh, as far as I know, she's done a lot of movies since. I just haven't seen them yet. Yeah, and she's a. I, I really like her as a director. I would actually, if I, if the Hannah Words was a movie, I would love for her to direct it. That's what I was going to get onto next. Actually, that she would be a perfect fit for this, like based on how you describe it. <laughs> yeah, I think she would be great for it. And she's she's doing. Um, I don't know if you know this book. Um, it's called The Serpent's Puppet. It's uh, an MG book. It's by Sayantani Dasgupta. I have I have heard of the name of the book. Yeah, uh, what's it about? I might recognize it. Um, it's basically a fantasy about this um twelve year old girl who has been told by her parents that she is an Indian princess, 
and she doesn't believe them. But then one day she comes home to find her parents missing and these Rakkosh demons are there trying to attack her. And she basically discovers she is an Indian princess and she has to go to another dimension to save her parents from the Serpent King. That sounds fucking awesome. Not gonna lie. Yeah. It's it's amazing and like it's a Bengali book as well. The author is Bengali and the character is Bengali. Um and yeah, she is directing the movie for it. So I'm really, really excited. What, what did you say the name of the book was? Uh The Serpent Secret. The Serpent Secret. Okay, I'm looking this up yeah. now because I'm sure I've heard of it. Uh Serpent Secret. Oh, and there's a well Wikipedia just said book two, so I'm assuming it's like uh it's gonna be more than one. Yeah, I think there's two books out. So the first one is called The Serpent Secret. Um, I can't remember the name of the second one now. Oh, oh man. Yeah, I do recognize that. That is an awesome fucking cover. Yeah, those covers are absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I just I have a thing for, like, neon-y co- covers. And honestly, like, that cover is even more stunning, like, when you see it in person. It's so beautiful. I can imagine so. And, I mean, I, I, mean, I write middle grade, so... That would be a great one to add to my collection. Yeah, it's great. It's amazing. Well, the book depository list is increasing by the second. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on that, um, have you ever thought about maybe uh, like fan casting your books? I know a lot of authors do that, but the only um, the only big Muslim actors I can think of right now are uh, Riz Ahmed and Kamil Nanjiani, just off the top of my head. No, not really, because, um, like, if if the Hannah Wars was ever a movie, I would really love for the characters to be, like, authentic, so for them to be, like, Bangladeshi, specifically, um, and there aren't a lot of actors who are Bangladeshi, um, as far as I know, or I don't really know any actors, uh, especially ones who would fit within, like, the age range, um, and the love and trust in the Hannah Wars is... Um, Brazilian, um, and she's like biracial, um. So I would love for that to be there as well. But I also don't know about a, of a lot of biracial Brazilian actors in that age range. So I just like I just imagine it in my head without any actors. Oh, you see, you see the character first, not the actors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because like even off the top of my head right now, the only big Muslim actors I can think of are Mahersha Ali, Kamil Nanjani, and Riz Ahmed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I, I mean I love Camille Nanjani. He's fucking hilarious. Yeah, I like I really love those actors, but obviously they wouldn't be a very good fit. Well, no, not for uh not for two teenage girls running a, a <laughs> No, that might be a little bit strange. I feel like Camille Nanjani would give it a go though. <laughs> like he'd try his hardest. <laughs> no, Mahersh- 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 Ali is gonna be too busy being blade. But no, this is why I think I'm like, I'm a little bit worried about the, to go back to Kamala Khan, about the Miss Marvel movie. Yeah, we were um, talking about this on Twitter as well. Yeah, because like, there, I think there are, there are more Pakistani actors, um, like in Pakistan as well, um, because they have, there's a lot of like Pakistani like drama series and stuff. My mom always watches them, so that's why I know about that. Um, but they're usually quite light skinned. Um, and Kamala is like quite dark skinned, yeah. um, especially for somebody who's Pakistani. So I really hope that they manage to get somebody who is Pakistani and Muslim and hopefully dark skinned as well. Yeah, because I, I remember we were talking about this on Twitter. Like, I think I put the question for should it be animated or live action? But for me, that was uh-huh. purely because I, because of her power set. I'm worried in like live action, it would look like Fantastic Four. <laughs> But with animation, yeah. like it could look like The Incredibles. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, like I just love animation. I like animated movies. Yeah. So, honestly, I would love an animation. But also, like because of the representation, I think a live action movie would mean a lot more if they can get it right. Yeah, definitely. I, mean, I don't. Is it a movie they're doing on this, of this, or is it a TV show? I can't remember. I think it's a TV show, actually. A TV show. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a Disney Plus TV show, but they have said mm-hmm. uh, these these are going to tie into the movies later on. 
So you could probably see yeah. it in like a Young Avengers movie or something if that gets greenlit. Mm-hmm. I'm just really sad that uh, because of the whole Sony deal, she won't ever get to interact with Peter Parker. <laughs> like I've wanted to see that for so long. Yeah, did they did they interact in any of the comics? I'm not sure about the comics. I know they interacted in one animated series, and I believe they had like really good chemistry. Oh, okay. Plus, I, plus, I kind of just want to see Spider Man and everything because I'm a Spider Man nut. That's fair enough. I, mean, uh, I even saw this thing uh, recently where it was a, a Muslim artist who, uh, after Spider Verse, he drew a Spider Man that was kind of like it was a Muslim version of him, and it kind of adapted the sort of Muslim dress into a Spider Man costume, and it looked fucking cool. That sounds really cool. Yeah, I mean, Spider Verse said there's a Spider Man for everybody, so I say like, why not just do a million little movies about each different Spider Man, and then everybody can see themselves as that hero. Yeah, and uh, you and Farida are, like, really good friends, right? Yeah, we're really good friends. I, I-, I could kind of just imagine, like, uh, since your books are coming out so close together, like, you guys going on this r- wild book tour together. <laughs> that would actually be, that would be amazing, Um, but, I don't, like, I don't know if it would work, because... Our books are so different. Like, my book is, like, really happy, people falling in love. And Frida's book is, like... Really dark and, like... Twisted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, so... <laughs> well, maybe we could, like, balance, balance each other out. People read my book and they're really happy. and then Or they read her book and they're like, oh, oh, everything sucks. So they read my book and they're like, like well... A, yours is like a palate cleanser? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh jeez, the way these conversations go, they just spiral out, man. It's, it is insane. Uh, I'm so glad I'm doing this show again. Uh, but uh, I think that's more or less all I've really got time for. Because I didn't when I when I advertised this out, I didn't get much questions, and I more or less just wanted to know about your writing journey and your inspirations and that, but. Now, just for the closing bit, I want to leave it on a bit of an inspiring note, since uh, your book's very happy. Well, what what would be the best advice you would give to any uh, marginalized reader or writer out there who was maybe in your situation a few years ago, but now you've got a debut? I guess, what would you say to them? I would say to find your community. I think that's the most important thing you can do, because as a marginalized writer, it's really difficult to feel supported, um, like supported by people in general, but supported by um, like publishing as an industry, you're definitely going to come up against hurdles. You're going to come up against gatekeepers. So it's important to have um, people there who understand what you're going through and people there who can say that I understand why this is happening and it's not because of your book um, or it's, it's not because you're not talented. And, and they can listen to you vent and they can give you the advice that you need. So finding a community that will support you, that will stay with you, and that will understand what you're going through is really, really important in this industry. I think that's a great way to end off of. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. You've been a delight to talk to. I can't wait to read your book. I'm probably going to be in happy tears for at least a week <laughs> after it. And, uh, I mean, if you're ever in Glasgow, um, I'd love to meet you someday. Or if I'm ever in Dublin. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Yeah, and I would love to meet you as well. So if I'm ever in Glasgow, I'll definitely let you know. Yeah, but me me and Farida have been talking about meeting up, but it's just like we never have found the time yet because I I imagine she's really busy up in, I think it's Edinburgh she stays in. Uh, I think she's in Aberdeen. Oh, man, that's even further. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but uh, r- regardless, uh, if we're ever in the same ke- same area, I'd love to hang out with you. Cause you you guys seem really cool. <laughs> so do you. So um, maybe we can all meet up sometime soon, all together. Fantastic. As long as it's not in Renfrew, because this place sucks. <laughs> I've actually I've been trying to get free that to come to Dublin for like a year, but it hasn't happened. I think I saw something on Twitter where it was like. I know it was probably a joke or something, but you were, like, trying to force her to come to Dublin? <laughs> yeah, basically, I told her that 
um, because Ireland is really windy, like Scotland. Um, so I said to her, like, when you land in Dublin, like sometimes, or a lot of the times, it's a very, it's a little bit of a rough landing because of the wind. Um, and it freaked her out. And I was like, you live in Aberdeen. Like, you are used to this. I, I can confirm that. I was born in Aberdeen. And their <laughs> winds are not very, uh, they're not very forgiving. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I saw like, someone without an umbrella and they turned into Mary Poppins just from the wind. Yeah, I mean, I saw, I think there was a, when there was Hurricane Ophelia, I think, or no, not even Hurricane Ophelia. Um, it was a storm, not a hurricane. And there was a video in, I think, Glasgow Airport of the plane, like, being pushed up by the wind. Yikes. <laughs> oh, that, that, that kind of stuff gives me the fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, more, more or less, uh, th- thanks so much for coming on. You're welcome back anytime if I ever have repeat guests. And But uh, more or less, this show's all about just talking about talk- really passionate writers, and you're clearly one of them, so... Uh, where can people find you? And uh, have you got anything else you'd like to plug? Um, you can find me on my website, which is adibajagardar.com. On Twitter, I'm at adiba underscore j. And on Instagram, I'm on dibs underscore j. Um, I don't have anything to plug, but Farida has a new podcast called The Right Type, which you should definitely listen to. I have been meaning to listen to that, like, ever since you started debuting it. Uh, it's just, I have been so stuck trying to find job interviews. But, you know what, I'm probably actually going to, ironically, I'm probably going to be listening to that while I'm editing this. <laughs> it is, like, uh, it's, a good, it's a good podcast. Um, I think she has three episodes out so far, and the next one is about querying, so I'm excited to listen to that. Same, well, check out those things out, guys, and... Uh, as always, uh, hit subscribe if you want to see more episodes. Follow us both on uh, all the social medias. And I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.